my last military assignment, well, I, I heard about returning POWs, returning uh, to uh, the border area of North and South Korea from uh, being uh, prisoners of war, mostly in Chinese <coughs> or North Korean hands. And uh, uh, I heard that they were being interviewed and people were confused by them because some had expressed communist images or beliefs. Uh, all of them were confused. And I could arrange to be transferred to uh, Korea. I'd been in Korea for six months back in Japan to be transferred back to Korea to join in that process with military psychiatrists. And that consisted of interviewing people individually and then returning to the United States on a troop ship called the General Pope, in my case, in which I did more and others, more interviews and group sessions with returning POWs. And what I experienced then was that this was a really interesting and uh, kind of unknown process. There had been a lot of hysteria about it uh, in various ways, even with the term, quotes, brainwashing, a dubious term, but you can't get rid of it. It's here to stay with us. Uh, and. Uh, and it was really interesting to look into it, to interview people, to find out what was at issue. But that wasn't so easy to do in a military setting, where one is concerned, one can only have a certain amount of time, and one is worried that if one writes certain things uh, on a report, it could uh, hurt the individual person who's being interviewed. And from there, I was later able to do a more systematic and thorough study in Hong Kong of um, two types of people. One were Westerners, Europeans and Americans who had been imprisoned and accused of being spies by the Chinese communists and of Chinese intellectuals and students who were put through a systematic so-called thought reform program uh, that I studied and later wrote about. I wanted to just go now to, in a way, your entry into the psychoanalytic world and the Boston psychoanalytic Society. So what, what was your sense of, of what that world was like when you first entered into it? Um, as, I was, uh, as I had my residency training here in New York, and uh, it was then dominated by psychoanalytic thought, and our most interesting teachers were psychoanalysts. Uh, but I also noticed a hardening of psychoanalytic dogma. And uh, I was interested in history very early, even in... Uh, secondary school and university. Uh, history was a, a, a major concern of mine. And when I read the early psychoanalytic literature about history, I could see that when looked at dogmatically, uh, one could uh, reduce history into psychopathology or into clinical terms, uh, whether it's oral, anal cultures, or uh, classical psychoanalysis in my evolving judgment, didn't do too well with history. Uh, I was influenced enormously by Eric Erickson, who, uh, who really got when, into... When did you first meet him? I met him in 1956, soon after I came back with my work on thought reform, but before mm -hmm. I published my first book. And it was interesting in that uh, I was humble and awed by him because I, I had read him and admired what he was doing. Uh, and he was enormously interested in me, not in me personally, but Chinese thought reform had reverberations for him in terms of what he was interested in. And, you know, uh, mentors can be interested in followers quite a lot, especially when they bring certain kinds of work that feed their own imagination. And he was about to go off to write Young Man Luther, and he could immediately make associations between uh, Chinese intellectuals being pressured in the thought reform process and Luther being trained for the church in another totalistic process. So I had great ambivalence about psychoanalytic training. I thought it was still the most interesting and thoughtful psychology we had available to us, necessary for an approach to history. On the other hand, I thought that if taken uh, literally, in its uh, more narrow dogma, you were really uh, eliminating history in the name of studying it. Uh, and Erickson was an enormous uh, help to me because I, I could perceive that he had the same ambivalence, and he had been working creatively with that ambivalence for 40 years.
Right. One of the things you took, um, I don't know if it was from the psychoanalytic experience or where, but it was the idea of the one-to-one -one interview as a kind of research tool. And in your work, well, in the work in the 50s, um, all the way through the work in Hiroshima that you did with survivors of the Hiroshima uh, uh, catastrophe, through the work with Vietnam vets and on, you used yes. it, and through to the Nazi doctors and Aum Shinrikyo in the 1990s, which we'll perhaps come to later, but you used this method. So can you just say something about how you developed that method of work? It evolved from my own residency training in psychiatry in terms of being taught the uh, what was called a modified psychoanalytic interview. And that meant what it sounds like, in which one interviewed people seeking to understand motivations, hearing them out, uh, and, uh, and drawing upon psychoanalytic principles. Uh, I realized, and, and this, uh, uh, as Daniel said, it, it, it's been a central method all through my work, all through these different studies. But when I was confronted with the first study in Hong Kong in some depth of thought reform, uh, I naturally went about it by using a further modification of this interview method, more in a direction of dialogue, because in every interview, there's a good book by Harry Stack Sullivan, the Neo-Freudian, about the interview method, and he makes very clear, very simple point. Both sides in the interview have to get something out of it. And I was getting a lot out of it in learning about thought reform. What were they getting out of it was the question. And I suppose both people are affected by it consciously and unconsciously was an assumption you had as well, that you, there's an impact on the interviewer as well of, of working in this way. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, that idea wasn't alien to psychoanalysis. No. Uh, but, uh, it, I mean, the interviews were very intense. They were interesting. They were fascinating because... Um, there was the extremity of pressures, psychological pressures, and in the case of Westerners in prison, physical pressures and torture and, so, and false confessions as well. But uh, in terms of what I could offer the people I was interviewing, I, became, I came to realize it had to do with a certain kind of therapeutic element. I wasn't in any way their physician or or their their uh, therapist and and didn't want to be, but they could feel and I could experience and I think my medical training contributed to that some sense that I was concerned with sympathetic to their struggles uh, to overcome their confusion uh, and they could get that kind of benefit from this interchange. But I had to uh, I had to supplement that interview method with what I called a mosaic method, and that really meant intense reading um, in uh, cultural issues, because I worked in Hong Kong in Chinese culture, then in Japan, in Japanese culture, in Germany, in German culture, and uh, uh, you can't really understand what happens in an interview unless you know quite a bit about that culture. And I wasn't looking for cultural distinctions as my main approach, but rather for how cultural, uh, cultural elements, cultural emphases take one to the universal.